Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, maybe let's get started. Uh, in the lecture announcement, uh, Darren Green is the official host, but he's uh, busy with other meetings, so I'm not a uh, Darren. I'm uh, Zeng Yuzhan. It's my real pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our today's speaker, Pascal Fuya. Uh, Pascal Fuya and I, we know each other from a long, long time ago, maybe 25 years ago, I don't know, long time ago. <laughs> Uh, from France uh, at Himalaya. Uh, he is a world leading expert in 3D computer vision, especially in stereo and in 3D reconstruction. Uh, but uh, I don't know uh, today's topic, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, he is a professor at the EPFL, uh, Swiss, Swiss, no, Swiss Federal Institute, Institute of Technology, Technology in Lausanne, uh, and he is an Archbishop uh, Fellow. Pascal. Thank you. Okay, so yes, I've, uh, we've I've known. Never seen this one. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> uh, but okay, so we knew each other uh, way back when, when we were doing our thesis or postdocs. And at the time, I was working on cartography and aerial photos and that sort of things. Mm -hmm. And it may sound weird that I have moved now to uh, modeling uh, brain structure, but in fact, to me, it's kind of a return to things I was doing a long time ago because what it is, is cartography of the brain. So instead of being aerial cartography, it's brain cartography, but in many ways it's very similar. So to give you a notion of what kind of images we are playing with, here, here's one. So what you're seeing here on the left is what you see if you open the skull of a rat and stick uh, what's called a two-photon microscope and you see this network of uh, dendrites that are fluorescent. Then if you zoom in, still with the two-photon microscope, you see, you see what's in the middle. And um, basically the dendrites are slightly higher resolution. You have a kind of a spaghetti soup. And what you would want to do is get the topology out of it. The ultimate goal of this sort of thing is something called connectomics, where you, you want to get a wiring diagram and not at the small part of the whole brain, but that's still some distance away. And if once you have zoomed that much, you can change microscopes and use an electron microscope to zoom even more, and now you're looking inside the cells, and you see the structures inside the cells, which are referred to as organelles. So this is micrometer resolution, this is 5 nanometer resolution. There's a factor 200 between here and there. And this is the range of scales we're interested in. We want to build sensory maps from this. And in a sense, it's, as we'll see, it's not that different from building maps of the Earth from images at very different resolutions. You want to extract very different kinds of structures and then put them together into some form of unified framework. So this is, I mean, the long-range goal. We are nowhere near there. So what I'd like to talk about today is what we've actually been doing. And what we've been doing is to try to delineate some of the dendritic tree, so the spaghetti soup, in the low-resolution images, meaning micrometer in this case, segmenting the high-resolution images, so the electron microscopy images, to find these uh, intracellular structures, and then registering the one and the other so that in the end we can build integrated maps. So let's start with uh, the delineation. So here's an image. This one's actually relatively easy. But let me outline the process. So here is an, uh, an image. In fact, of course, we, we, we work with volumetric data. All the images we deal with are cubes of data. And we first run the filter that is going to respond maximally at the center of a tube. It's looking for tubular structures. We are going to look for maxima of this tubularity measure, which are these red dots. 
And given the red dots, we are going to connect each one to all the dots in some neighborhood, in some sphere, by computing a path of maximum tubularity. I'll define this a bit more precisely in a moment. And finally, given this graph, we look for a tree, because we know that the, the dendrites actually physiologically form a tree. So let's look at these steps in a little bit more detail. So we start with a cube of data like this one. And I like this one not because it's particularly high quality, quite the reverse, actually. It's a, it's a very noisy data set. And if you look at it carefully, you will see that these so-called tubes are, in fact, little globs of things. Because the way you obtain an image like this is you take the tissue, which initially is just gray. Everything is gray. And you dye some cells to make them stand out. And the dyeing process is not perfect. It's actually very noisy. And you get these uh, nasty looking tubes. And that's what you have to work with. Um, so the first step is to run a filter. And the filter is fairly standard. It's called the oriented flux filter. It's designed to respond at really at, at maximally at pixels that are in the center of a tube. And you run, the, you run this for several scales, because these things have width, of course. So you are going to generate a 4D volume, which is the response at every location for a range of, uh, of possible width. And you are going to look for local maxima in this 4D volume. That will give you a. So it's. I mean, if you run it for a single width, you get a 3D volume, which is all the responses. But you run it for several possible widths of the filter, and then you get a 4D volume. So originally, it's a volume there. The volume is 3D initially. Not just a slice. No, no. We, everything we do is on 3D volumes. Except debugging. I mean, okay. oftentimes you yeah. will debug uh -huh. on a 2D slice, but the real computation is on 3D. Um, and then, once you have these local maxima, you connect them by a path, which I'm going to call a tubular path. By essentially, you formulate that as finding a geodesic path in this 4D volume, where the four dimension or the three, the three spatial dimension plus width which is how you get this network of things where there, it's represented as being irregular because the widths are not constant along the path. And it is a graph because for every local maximum, you connect it to all the other local maximum within some distance. And the final step is within this graph, you're going to look for a tree. And the tree is going to be a tree it's a mac that maximizes the a posterior probability of it being the right tree, given the quality of these paths that you measure. And that actually involves some machine learning. So if I compare this to what we were doing when we do donating roads way back when at INRIA last millennium, um, all this was hand-tuned. It was a ton of parameters that were all hand-tuned. Now we don't do this anymore. What we do is we compute, in this case, gradient-based features, gradient histograms of uh, direction of gradients. We run machine learning algorithm. And that will actually give us a way to evaluate the quality of this individual path in a slightly more principled way. This graph is a 2D equivalent. So you have to be, has been uh, projected to a flat I mean, the, the, I mean, this is what I'm showing is a projection, but the real thing is in 3D. Okay, in this particular projection, is there any particular meaning of this, uh, uh, like each axis? Is there the meaning to what? To the. Like, uh, which the X and Y? And is, is this, no, there's. A particular scale? Or is this no, there's, there's actually no meaning. It's just the only thing that has meaning is the width of the tube really is correspond to real measurement in the image. OK, and that's another thing that's changed in the last say, 20 or 25 years. 25 years ago, the algorithms we were using to do this would have been basically the basic algorithm was to look for a minimum spanning tree. And it turns out that's not the right thing, or it's not the best thing you can do in this case, because when you look for these local maxima, so maybe I'll go back 
to this slide, the local maxima are these red dots you're trying to connect. And typically what's going to happen is you always find a few in the middle of nowhere. Um, so if you run a spanning tree, a minimum spanning tree style algorithm, it's going to want to span everything and give you a weird topology and then simply pruning the bad branches is not going to be enough. So a better way to do this is, that, is to use more recent algorithms that says is you can actually formulate finding the best tree in a graph as a linear program. And not only that, but you, you now have algorithms that will, it's NP hard. So for any relatively big um, tree, you can do it, but you have good approximation algorithm that gives you to within really epsilon, where epsilon is small, of the optimum. So now finding the best tree is really finding the maximum of a well-defined objective function, which is always nice. In this tree, I'm sorry, in this formulation, you would allow uh, along some points, some places to be isolated. Yes, that's, that's actually the whole point is you, some points can be completely ignored. So it will, it might accept a few bad edges because if you have two very good parts of the tree and you need a bad edge to connect them, it will accept it, but it will not, it, it, it's just as happy to leave a whole bunch of points unconnected. But would you allow like two, two trees that yes. are disconnected? Yes. So actually, you'll see this in a moment. Um, could you explain a little bit what this formula means? Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, whoa. Um, now this is being mean. So the, the optimization problem, so Q, what does QMIP mean? QMIP means quadratic uh -huh. mixed integer program. And the objective function at the top is what you're trying to minimize is you have these edges. So TIJ is a binary variable that says whether the edge connecting node i to node j is active or not. So you have this big graph, and you're trying to turn on and turn off some edges. Um, and the cost here is something that has to do with the fact that every individual edge has a cost, which is what machine learning was all about. So the individual edges assign a number between 0 and 1 saying, do these look like they could be dendrites or not, based on my training data? Plus, and that's the reason it's a binary thing, we have terms that says that successive edges have to be compatible. So they have to be compatible in the sense that their width ought to be compatible. I mean, you don't connect a very wide thing to a very thin thing. You don't, this being biology structures, you prefer to have edges that are smooth to edges that are, that are doing right angles. And that's essentially what this encodes. And then the rest is essentially is a way of saying that if you turn on and off these TIJ and TJK, but you want to turn them in such a way so that the result is a tree. And it turns out that this essentially is a flow formulation and you express the fact that you turn them on and off in such a way that if you start from the root, there will always be an, a connected path from the root to whatever edge is turned on. And so, of course, the reason I'm not, I mean, this is not something we invented, right? This is standard, uh, this has become standard ways of finding trees in, uh, in graphs. Um, Okay, so in this example, we have this, uh, this stack, and this is what you could do by hand. So when I say by hand, the way this is done is you have a, um, a victim, also known as a grad student, uh, who uh, essentially went and clicked at uh, various points, and then we have a semi-automated uh, path, it computes the path semi-automatically to generate this. So this is the best we as people can do. Uh, and this is what this version of the algorithm does, which is actually not exactly the same, but it's pretty close. And actually here are shades of things that were already true in the 1980s, which is when you were doing automated mapping software, full automation was a pipe dream. The system that truly worked are the ones that did a lot of the job 
automatically, but then with a good interface to actually fix the mistakes. And I think it's still going to be true in 2015, whenever people start using this. Um, and so this is what we did uh, that was our CVPR paper last year. And one thing we've realized this year is actually when I told you we are looking for trees, it's actually not what we should be doing. Because in this kind of data, the data we are working on is relatively low resolution. So what often happens is you have two branches. There are really two branches. But because the thing is blurry, you don't, they look like they touch each other. Because there's, a, especially in the Z direction, these optical microscopes have a lot of blur. So if in a case like this one, where you have two branches, these are really two different branches. In reality, they did not touch. But in practice, what happens is you find one point at the intersection and only one. So if you enforce strictly the tree constraint, meaning no cycles, you essentially force the algorithm to make mistakes because it cannot use this node for two different branches. So it turns out that we get better results even for structures that truly are trees by not enforcing strictly the tree constraint, modifying a little bit our objective function to say, okay, we are going to allow loops, but we are going to penalize, we don't want too many free hanging branches not too many terminations, and we actually uh, get better results this way. So it's essentially the same algorithm with a, a slightly different twist. And we produce this. So this, of course, this looks hopefully relatively nice, but I'll give you some numbers in a moment because in the end, that's the proof of the pudding. Um, and also, we've run this. Uh, here's another example that I like which is we've been collaborating with people at Harvard who use a technique known as the brainbow. That's actually beautiful. You, you genetically engineer a mouse so that different neurons generate, produce some different proteins that fluoresce at different colors when you shine a laser light on them. And so this is the, where the rainbow comes from, or the brainbow. Um, and the idea is to do, you know, you have some electric connectors where the different wires have different colors that makes it a lot easier to know what goes where. And so same idea here, except of course it's nowhere near as clear. So here is what you do by hand, here's what the algorithm does, and it's reasonably close. So the question of course is how close? Now, let's get to some, uh, some actual numbers. And it's actually, I mean, by the way, and that's true not only here, Quantifying how close to graphs are is not a trivial task. Because saying this is, I mean, because there are many, many different mistakes you can make. And quantifying which ones are more important. So the, the, the obvious one, it's worse to do a mistake close to the root than further away. And you have to quantify that. And that's actually not, there, I don't think there's any settled way of doing this. But, there was a challenge in uh, 2011 called the Diadem Challenge in which a bunch of uh, people were invited to run these kinds of algorithms. So there's a, it was a two-stage challenge where uh, first you got some images and you ran them in your lab, sent back the results. Based on this, there were five finalists chosen and invited to Genelia Farm near DC to do it on the spot. So we ended up being one of the five. And sadly enough, we didn't win. And, um, and actually, it was interesting because the people who won, who are these people, um, there's a team, the, the team leader is somebody called Roy Badry from uh, Texas. And uh, what they did is they had a real pipeline. Where they had the, their automated algorithm, I don't think they were that much better than ours. I would even claim they weren't. Uh, but they had a decent interface, they had a process, they had a whole production line assembly, and it worked. And we were the only ones who were actually uh, stupid enough. We didn't have an interface at all. 
was truly fully automated. Because the contest rules allowed for interaction. You would be penalized for, the more you interacted, the more penalized you would be, but it was allowed. Uh, okay, it's day one. Okay, so of course we are competitive in nature, so uh, we've been working, we've been at it since, and now we get numbers that are better at least than the one they using the code they publish on the web. So of course they would argue, I'm sure, that we are using their code badly or it's not the best they can do and essentially we need a rematch. But, uh, uh, they know these are okay. So these are, they are not these. These are, as I said, they are. They have scoring functions that are very complicated, and they, they have no. Well, okay. So I'll let you decide whether they have an. Okay. The truth is, in the real computation, the diadem score was is really an automated thing, but. When came time to actually decide who had won the competition, they threw it away, and they had human judge look at it. Oh. So, so there's no ground truth. Then. Sorry, well, there was ground truth. There was ground truth, but they were to decide who's. Uh, they, even the, the people that decided oh, this is not okay. believable, so, which is why actually the net net scores also come from this group. So we are using their metrics, we're trying to do it right, uh, to, to be better in the, in the... So as I said, actually, coming up with a good metric is an open research problem in, in of itself. So the number here on top is from zero to one, one is being the best? Uh, well, as usual in these slides, ours, you can decide, the bold ones are ours, it's always true. Yeah, but that's for that. Uh, yeah, the second one, why is smaller is better, right? Yeah, 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 yes. So, so this is, uh, I mean, I, I don't think you should. I mean, yeah. okay, so this is one of my pet peeve with papers in computer vision, and I'm sure with open the, the most recent CVPR proceedings. Mm -hmm. Everybody is the best. Because <laughs> everybody's numbers are in bold. There is something seriously wrong with this. You think it's wrong? <laughs> So in terms of the input, uh, you said actually a box or input box. Like a, you get like a variable box or there's a number there? Or there's I mean, in, in the end, these numbers are not comp computed in voxels. They are computed on, the, we return graphs. Oh. So it's a graph and these measures uh, essentially have measures of topology, how many, you know, wrong branches. It's not oh, a so distance. It's not a position. Or it's not a position. Oh, it's, okay. it's an attempt and that's what makes it hard actually. It's a, an attempt at measuring topology. So, uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I mean, I missed the beginning of your, so your, your, your background information. So, do those the lines, do, those are like a nerve? So like These are the, so the dendrites and the axons are essentially the wires in the brain that connect, that connect the, the various cells. So, each wire, each wire is actually a nerve? Um, no, they are, uh, essentially what, okay, you have a brain cell. Yeah. It has a, a nucleus, like all cells. And out of this nucleus comes something they call an axon. Oh. And the axon, so the, it generates the nervous um, influx, or whatever you want to call I mean, whatever the right name is. And this, and it is being connected to dendrites, which actually, so the axon come, goes out. You have connections between the axons and the dendrites of a different nerve cell, which actually receives this input. And that travels to the nucleus of the second cell, which then itself will generate something. And so you have a very, an extremely complex circuitry. And I have the number at the end. I think you had about 100 billion of these in, a, in, a, in your typical brain, uh, a th thousand times more connections. So it's really complicated circuitry. So uh, that's why we're saying at this point, we're at a uh, level we, we try to do one or two or three. Really, the target is billions, and so there's still some work to be done. Um, and uh, so that's the um, same algorithm, so different. So this is really back to, back to basics, uh, or back to my PhD, um, which is you can run exactly the same algorithm on aerial images. So 
what's changed here is, okay, we are not in 3D, we are now in regular 2D images. The, um, the tr we use different training data to score the quality of these paths, but the feature we use are the same. It's just we use different training data, and we run exactly the same algorithm, and we get fairly decent results. So here, the, I mean, the results have been offset on purpose, just to that uh, you can see the, orig the original image, but you get fairly decent results with exactly the same algorithm on a very different kind of data. So you actually literally compute image gradients? Well, yeah, yeah, we literally compute image gradients, we compute tuberity measures based on these image gradients, and we run the algorithm exactly the way I've described it. And that, that's actually the, the point that was made this morning, I think we talked about it about Darren, is one of the, in computer, science, in computer vision, there seems to be a division between biomedical imaging and regular computer vision, which does not exist. I mean, it's the same algorithm, and that's, personally, that's what I'm interested in. I mean, I'm doing computer vision algorithms. The brain uh, data is, is a fascinating application, but it is an application. It could be applied to something else. I'm sorry? The, the roads in this case is they are similar width. So in some sense, it's, it's easier here. But here you, even here you have some, I think, maybe not in those images. Uh, no, these images is true. They are mostly all similar width, but they don't have to be. Because after all, in real, you know, you have freeways and small, and small streets and... There is actually no, so the tree uh, assumption of the roads is clearly false. But on the um, brain images, it seems to be that what's, that's an artifact. So the, day, the, the reality is that those don't cross. Right. But can you get, so once you suspect those don't cross, can you go back to the data and figure out the thing you work on? You could. We tried that. We had an earlier version of the algorithm where wherever we suspected the junction, we would put two. Uh, vertices, but it was a little bit, you know, as of in computer vision, you are never so sure, and we had to tweak the numbers and tweak the parameters, and it, it wasn't really satisfactory. Okay, so that was the the delineation part of the talk. So now let's move to something else which is the processing of the high-level images. So the, um, the, in this case, what we are looking for, these intracellular structures, which are in the, I mean, there are many others, but the ones we've looked at are the synapses and the mitochondria. So the synapses, so here is a, maybe a diagram that explains a little bit what's happening, is you have the neuron, it generates an electrical impulse, and that electrical impulse is caught, I mean, goes through a junction called a synapse, and then travels to the nucleus of a different neuron. And at the junction, the electrical junction, or the chemical junction, is called a synapse. Uh, so the synapses are connectors, and so they are, why are they important? I mean, because if we're going to get the wiring diagram, the, the, the delineation gives you the topology, and who, who is talking to whom, and the synapse essentially gives you the strength of the connection. And another very important structure is something called the mitochondria. All of this has to be powered somehow. And the mitochondria are the structures inside the cells that produce the energy that's required to do this. Um, and one thing that, of course, where does this come from? As any respectable uh, computer scientist, uh, I got it off Wikipedia. And uh, this is, if you go read the Wikipedia page, this is what the mitochondria looks like. We look in, we'll see in a moment what they really look like. Um, OK, so the algorithm is, in fact, relatively standard. So the, the first one we did was you start with an image. So here I'm actually showing you a 2D slice because it's easier to show but the real computation is done on 3D blocks. So you take your image, 
you compute super, what we call super pixels or super voxel, you just group. Why? Because this is huge amounts of data, you want to condense it to something a bit more manageable by aggregating pixels. So once you've done that based on local statistics, you can assign to every super pixel a probability of being either inside or outside the mitochondria. So the blue ones look like they're inside, the red ones look like they're outside. You can also, because these super voxels sit on a grid, so you, again you have a graph, and it turns out that mitochondria have very recognizable membranes, they have thick double membranes. So you, what you can learn is, when you look at two neighboring super pixels, do they look like one is inside, the other is outside, does this look like the boundary of mitochondria? So you can look in this graph, you can assign probably to edges of being transitions from inside to outside. In this case, the red ones are the ones that are most likely to be transition. And so the place where you would want to put a boundary. So that gives you a unary term for the vox super voxels, a binary term for the connection between super voxels. And you feed that to a graph cut algorithm and you get your segmentation. And so now if you look at it in 3D, uh, now the, the, super, the mitochondria voxels have been colored blue, um, which means you can only keep them, you throw away everything else. And that's what the mitochondria look like in this particular volume. So they look like these long snaky things, uh, which is quite different. From the, uh, from the Wikipedia page. So, uh, by the way, it's not that the Wikipedia page is wrong. It's, in fact, it, they're showing you the mitochondria in some sp specific mus muscle cells, and they look very different. How, how, are the, uh, how are the 3D images obtained? Uh, so, the 3D, so it's an electron microscope, it's called FIPSM. So, FIPS stands for Focus Ion Beam. So you take your sample, you encase it in resin, and then you, you use an electron microscope to image the top, so it's called block face, to, to the face of the block. Then you, with the focus ion beam, you abrase five nanometer, a very thin slice, and you take another image and you do it again and again. Well, you actually cut it there. Yes, yeah, so I mean, there are other ways, but this particular process is, is, is destructive. It's destructive, uh, but it has one very nice feature for us. It gives you images that are isotropic. A lot of the biomedical data, often you have good resolution in XY and terrible resolution in Z. This particular modality is the same in all three directions. Um, okay. And actually, the, uh, something that's interesting and that uh, was striking that shows that it's important to visualize things. I showed this to the, the president of our university, and he is, a, he is a, um, a neuroscientist by training. And actually, he too was surprised to see this because all his career he had seen slices. And it's hard, even for somebody as bright as our president, to um, make the connection between these slices and these weird shapes. How big is this tissue? Is this like so this would be f about five, so it's about a thousand by a thousand at five nanometers, so it's by five micrometers. Yes, uh, but five micrometer, five, five by five by five. Okay, so this, uh, this works, worked enough to get at least some results, but um, there's actually one thing that, in the diagram, as I've described it, is not quite right which is, I told you we were computing a unary term and then a binary term and we were computing them independently. So the probability that the voxel is inside the mitochondria and then the probability of transition from inside to outside. But in fact, if you think about it, this, these two probabilities are highly correlated. And so that's not, conceptually that's not quite right. And the way to get around this problem is to use what's called a structured SVM which actually you can learn, you have a binary, um, a binary objective function with a, a unary term and a binary term 
all of these are essentially have, are controlled by weights that you learn. That's what you learn when you learn the SVM. And you can learn them jointly, which is a much better way of doing it. The problem is all structured SVMs that I know are linear because the cost of doing the learning is such that if you try to do it with kernelized SVMs, the computational cost explodes. So our solution to this is was to introduce what we called kernelized features. And the idea is very simple. It is you, first, you can first train an SV, a, a normal SVM on the unary terms of but what's inside and outside. That, that gives you a bunch of support vectors. And then you use as your feature vectors, not the original ones, but essentially the distances or the kernel distances from what you're trying to classify to the support vectors. And you learn a linear structured SVM on this. And in this way, you get the benefits of both the, the kernelized version of SVM and the structured SVM at an acceptable computational cost. And if you look at the, at the, at the corresponding paper, we've actually tried that, for example, on the Pascal database, and we get decent results. So again, it's an example of the algorithm was designed for biomedical stuff, but the technique itself is applicable to whatever you want. And the other thing that seemed to have helped is to modify a little bit the, the way you learn the model by uh, replacing the um, standard uh, way this is being learned by a uh, essentially a stochastic gradient descent approach, which appears to, get, to give better convergence when you do the learning. This is only available in the kernel. Right? Sorry? In the kernel, the second level. The second one, not the first one. The first one is a standard, yeah, it's, it's a no problem standard. You, go it's, back. It's, you, you go, go back, back so. and learn again, yeah. So basically what we're saying with this technique is the support vectors for the structured SVM are going to be pretty much the same. Okay. Okay. Uh, just the weights that are going to be yeah. different. And right. it turns out that in practice, this is, it seems to be a reasonable assumption. Okay, and final little refinement is, and that's an idea we got, um, Yuri Boykov has been doing graph cut for a long time and always comes up with incredibly uh, cute tricks, um, is that we have a problem where we have mitochondria that have an inside, a membrane that surrounds them and an outside. And in fact, it turns out that in this particular configuration, you can do a three-class, a three-label segmentation using external graph cut and be guaranteed a global optimum. So we've actually adapted this trick to our problem, and that also seems to give a boost to the performance. So when you, you put all of this together, in terms of you know, Jacquard index or the, the Pascal VOC score, we progressively get improvements in terms of when we compare to ground truth. So these numbers are, get better, but of course they are not 100%, which is where they, we want them to be. And as of today, the biggest problem we still have is the fact that um, these mitochondria, which we've realized that a little bit late, are not as isolated as we'd like them to be. What seems often to happen is, in fact, that see, they, they they are glued to each other or they touch each other. So for example, an image like this one, it will do this. I mean, basically these are really two mitochondria, they end up being modeled as one. And if you look at what that does, is uh, this is uh, what they look like. So they are, they are really even more complicated structures than the one I've shown you before. And the current algorithm, what it does, it will, these are, there are f really four different mitochondria here. It will just return one. So in practice, what we've done to be able to give to the neuroscientists something they could actually use is a, essentially a tool, not unlike GrabCut, I mean, that style of thing where you will allow a user to, uh, to click, sorry. Is there any shape higher than this? No, there isn't, and actually we, 
That, I mean, maybe we can talk about this later, but it's missing. Clearly, this whole big blob is not, a, once you get the result, this is not a single mitochondria. So even that blue, the purple or blue one, is that? They all, one? I mean, this is the final result when we fixed it by, with this semi automated approach. So they, they all are pieces of mitochondria, that's correct. But what the algorithm generates is one big connected component for all of them. We've had to do some manual processing to actually cut them apart and be able to color them. There are really four different mitochondria. But is that, so I guess you're talking about the four colors. Yes. But the, even the blue, the blue one, one is one, yes. The fact that there is a the branching the here. Branching? Yes, the, the neuroscientists told, tell us, yes, that's correct. And so in some sense, actually, that's something that uh, uh, this delineation stuff, I, it's getting to the point where maybe we should use some of delineation techniques. Because if we start getting these tree-shaped things, well. So each of those things is always like a pipe? Is that yeah. It should yes. be always yeah. like a pipe. Yeah, it is kind of a pipe. So I mean, at, so at least in this, well, in this kind of tissue, okay. because uh, you know, they, uh, they they can be, uh, they are also places where they kind of these little bean things. Uh, so depending on where you cut the tissue. <laughs> oh. And that, I mean, actually, that's why this kind of research is interesting. Is I, I I don't know that anybody truly knows the answer to your question, okay. because there are so many different stuff in the brain or anywhere else that you need these tools to go and actually gather some decent statistics about this. Do you want it? No, I was going to say, how, how do they know? So if you, as a non-specialist, looking at the images, mm -hmm. can you tell that the new one would actually be normal? No, I can't. I mean, I basically, <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, at some point we have some, we, we collaborate with the people, the neuroscience guys. And basically, we believe them. <laughs> there really isn't a much better uh, approach to this. So I mean, the way this is done, I mean, okay. So in practice, this is if you want to be a little bit more um, scientific about this, is you would have several different guys do it by hand independently and then compare. I mean, that's about the best you can do. The problem is, I mean, doing this by hand takes hours, days. I mean, it's, it's, it's seriously expensive in terms of man hours. So the, why, is that, why, is it, why is it important to really know different types? Whether there's four of them or three of them, why is that important? Because they want to know how many mitochondria you have per cubic uh, oh, okay. micrometer of brain in that particular kind of tissue. And if you lump all four together, then your statistics is completely off. So, so that number would affect the one, affect that you, whether the person is a smart or not smart? Well, okay, so the... <laughs> I don't know, I'm just... <laughs> okay, for example, so we are um, involved in a, in a project called the Human Brain Project, yeah. and the goal is to simulate a piece, a, a substantial piece of brain. And well, in the simulation, you're going to have to put statistics about virtual neurons, virtual mitochondria, virtual everything. And the virtual numbers should be close to reality. And so conceivably, it's our job to come up with the right numbers. Okay. So do the uh, mitochondria have comparable volumes? Are there similar sizes? Um, because if you're recognizing that they're, if you drew a histogram of the size, they're predominantly in one particular size range, and then you've got a big blob which is showing up that's four times the volume. Which, yeah, that would be an, so after the fact, we can probably process this and say this looks weird. So you could imagine in the system that at least would tell the operator, yes, this looks weird, you, you better look at it. But, it, but you've still got billions, potentially. That, right. so yeah, so you would want to limit this yeah. as much as possible. And yeah. So maybe for those areas where you know there's a problem because the volume's mm -hmm. large, you go back and you do a different 
resolution of segment, you know, when you do the segmentation, right. the, the coarsening, you, you, you do that slightly different. We would. I mean, it sort of gets into this issue that, I mean, all the people here who've dealt with segmentation know it. the algorithm we're using still use very local information. Our algorithm does not understand. Somebody mentioned, you mentioned shape priors. There isn't any, but it's not good, but it's also because it's really hard to do. And so that's why uh, this is basically what I'm showing you is one PhD. I think there'll be others on the same topic. Okay, so for example, to try to get a handle about whether this is useful at all or not, here is essentially what algorithm produces, and the colors here are random. It's just the various connected components just give them different colors just to visualize. And this is a cleaned up output with a, a person in the loop who's actually done the cutting, refined the things a bit, and classify the mitochondria as belonging to either the axons or the dendrites. Because these are the things they want to know. Now it's getting to what the neuroscientists want out of this. Um, and some timing information. So this is what happens if you do it purely by hand. This is what it does when you use the competing system. And, um, and that's, what, that's us. And here I've broken down the time into the automated algorithm I've described. And the reason there's still manual intervention is because we need to train. So we need to get some data initially to, to, to do the training. Then we need to do a little bit of splitting. So we use our grab cut style algorithm to split the mitochondria. And this, actually this, we have a debate. The guy who does this is a serious perfectionist. So that's him. This is the time he ties in you know, correcting the things and cleaning them up really the way he wants them. And I think this actually could be um, shortened quite a bit if we use things, again, 1980s technology, different ball models, snakes, that sort of things. So we'll probably have to do that as well. And in the end, with all this, and that's what we are after, we get similar precisions to what you would do by hand or using the competition, but much faster. So I don't think we are going to get rid of manual, uh, manual intervention anytime soon. What we can hope to do is it used to take a week it'll be done in two hours. Yes? So here you say you do all this conventional precision and hand over to the doctor or the expert. Right. So I wonder, do you have a close look, actually, you get expertise opinions from the evaluator, from the doctor, say, the perhaps will tell you what other areas are more important or other areas perhaps less important even if there's an error. So then you do a close look. Yeah, we, I mean, essentially that's what we're doing. It's essentially they, we show them the result and say, oh, so what's the biggest, pro what's the biggest problem? And, uh, and the, the, that's why I'm showing this thing about the, the merged mitochondria. That's, at this point, that's what bothers them most. And uh, once we fix that, I'm sure they'll, they'll come up with something else they don't like. But, uh, but for the evaluation, do you put different weights on different mistakes? Uh, uh, we, I think we haven't done it formally yet, but I mean, we're not, basically, we're not yet at the point where we do a renal you know, clinical evaluation. It's still too early for that, but. I take it you're, um, back to the closed loop issue. I take it you're not at a point where you have enough data that has been human corrected to be able to model those corrections. No. System no, not yet, no, because our, it's also because the algorithms change too much and uh, it's, I think, ev that I eventually, I mean, it's an important thing, but we're not there yet. Okay, so this was mitochondria. Let me say a few words about synapses. So uh, how would you detect a synapse if you are a person? Well, what you know is that synapses are very are characterized by what's called um, a post the a postsynaptic region and a presynaptic region. And if you look at them, the presynaptic region has little 
thing is called vesicle. It's very specific texture. The postsynaptic texture region, the postsynaptic region does not. And between them, there is this thing called the synaptic cleft, which is this thick black thing. Which means that if you look at an image like this one, there is a thick black thing, but it's not surrounded by a pre and a postsynaptic region. So I don't know what it is, but it's not a synapse. So what you want is a detector that understands this. And this is what we've designed, which is a detector that essentially is post-indexed. So you compute a general orientation. That's relatively easy. And then it has learned to essentially sample the space at various orientations and distances from the center, computing uh, features, and learning to recognize the synaptic voxels from the non-synaptic ones. So the features you've described there are, uh, are evident in, in 2D. In 3D. Uh, in the, uh, okay, so there is, I was going to, that, that was a question, I guess. Is there something else to do with the volumetrics of the. the no, it, it's really 3D. Again, I, is, I, I make my drawings in 2D, but they are really 3D things because these boxes are essentially referenced with respect, with respect to the center in 3 You sample the, the 3D orientation sphere. Right, but, but so are they circular in shape? Okay, so the the synapse that that, that region, the, the the region that you explore, yes. But we okay, so we normally we should these guys should be spheres, but we use cubes because they are close enough and a lot easier to compute. No, I, uh, what I was meaning about the the form of the synapse itself is spherical. Yeah, is spherical. Right. Okay, so the, so there is another property potentially that you could explore, which is is this artifact round. Right, yeah. Okay, and so uh, here's what it does. And so what happens is you, now the, the synaptic pixels have been colored red, and I have the usual thing saying, well, we do better than our friends. Uh, and what it looks like is in 3D again, in that volume, these are all the synapses. The color mean nothing. They're just for to look pretty. And essentially, the synapses, or the synaptic cleft to be precise, look like these kind of flattened pancakes with occasional holes in them. And that's actually, according to the neuroscientist, this is right. This is what they look like. Well, some of them are really thin, or long in shape. Some mm. of them. Yeah, I mean, they come in various shapes, and that's actually. There again, they want statistics because this tells them what the strength of the connection between two neurons is. Oh, so, that's, oh. so different connections have different kind of connections. Different strength of connection. Oh. I mean, the volume or the thickness or the area of the connection, all of these have meaning to them. And the, and the hole is where you've forgotten something. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I mean, uh, synapses, especially during morpho uh, brain morphogenesis, they appear, they disappear. Actually, one of the guys uh, here, I was uh, from Harvard, is, tells that learning is actually about losing synapses, not gaining them. And that, in the, at least for muscles, when the baby is born, everything is connected to everything. It's a mess. And progressively, as the baby learns how to handle his muscles, a lot of the connections are severed until only the right ones remain. So it's a pruning, pruning process. This is a pruning process. So arguably, by listening to me, you've been losing synapses because oh, you've learned nice. something. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, anyway. Uh, maybe a little detour is we can detect synapses one thing we've been looking at um, in connection with this is, so you were asking about the process. So the process is to take this cube, uh, abrase a thin layer, and then scan. And in fact, uh, it's called a scanning electron microscope because it scans many, many, many times. In, in fact, I think for the image that I've shown you, it's 44 scans for every pixel. Uh, because individual scans are very noisy, and you need to average them to get something decent. 
But then that gives uh, rise to the following idea. If you want to speed these things up because, okay, five nanometer, you know, this cube of five nanometers, there's a lot of them in the brain. So is technology, I mean, everything that can speed up the process is good to have. Uh, so what you could say is, I know I'm looking for synapses. I'm not interested in anything else. I should only scan the places where there are synapses. And so one of the things we've been working on is to uh, develop techniques where you scan once, you train your classifier, say, okay, this area might contain synapses, but this one definitely not. And you rescan only the one where it is likely that you're going to find something you're interested in. And in the end, so that's what it looks like, meaning you end up, for your whole image, you only scan the maximum number of times some specified areas where it looks most likely that there will be something. And that's actually, we, we talked about astronomy this morning. I mean, I don't know anything about astronomy, but it seems to me that if you are scanning vast portions of the sky, some of the same problems are bound to arise. Uh, Yes, so because the scanning software is designed to scan a rectangle. So you can specify, please scan. So of course, then it becomes a slightly, if you want to do it right, because there is a cost to scanning a rectangle, to placing this, to moving the scanning head to exactly. So uh, these, oh, I should say, this is, these are simulations. We have not done this for real yet. But we are now, on the basis of this, we're going to collaborate with a, a small company in Canada that builds, that makes the scanning software. And to see if we can actually integrate that in the real thing, so that eventually it ends in, into a real microscope. Uh, and we have some simulation results that's, that show that uh, with this approach, we get, we lose a little bit of performance in terms of detection, but not much, but we can make things a lot faster. Okay, and final things. And, uh, sorry. Um, and, and you, no, I, I can ask later. So. You want to? No, uh, so I was actually curious about this thing that you said about two, there is this work in mitochondria and synapses. I was wondering, like the learning problem of, um, like, let's say a lot of data, my, label data of mitochondria, and you can model something about the imaging system itself. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to transfer that to other sort of objects, synapses, or other parts? Of okay, so that's. Again, that's a very good question. Is right now what we've done is we know our target object. Yeah. So I'm sure there is a way of doing this yeah. without a specific target in mind. Or at least, okay, the, all you know is brain tissue. Right. And you know something about the statistics of brain tissue. And then you could probably use things that I mean, there's been a lot of techniques about denoising uh, and all these techniques in general that probably could be used because, in fact, if for those of you who've worked on denoising, the way the averaging is done should have you scream because they take individual pixels and they average them. They never look, and that's, we know that's not the right thing to do, so there is a lot of unexplored stuff to be looked at. Okay, so final thing, and maybe I'll go quickly, which is, okay, I've told you about finding linear structure on the image on the left. I have told you about finding intracellular structures. And this and that are images of the same thing at a very different resolution. In other words, this is somewhere in here. Question is where? So this is a good old registration problem. The problem is here is we can't do it the way we traditionally do this by uh, finding feature points and matching them, the appearance is just too different. It won't work. So the solution we've been working on is to use to find linear structures at one scale, linear structures at the other scale, and now you know that this is a subgraph of that. And the question is where? So we've developed an algorithm that essentially does not use appearance but tries to match junction in the two graphs so that you can uh, register them. So it's actually a two-phase process. If I give you a blue graph and a red graph, it will first try to find corresponding junctions in a two-graph to get a coarse registration. 
and then uh, we'll do fine alignment to bring the two graphs in correspondence to each other. And, that's, and that actually works on lots of things. So you can, for example, you can register retinal scans. Um, so these are two different retinal scans, same person, but because they were taken at two different times, there is a bit of deformation between one and the other. You can do that on angiograms. Arguably, you could also do that. I've talked to uh, you know, soldiers in the field who you take a picture of, uh, of uh, what you see. You, you will see linear structure streets. You could match them against uh, your, uh, you know, the mapping software you have on your, uh, in your backpack. And you can do it, which of course is, doesn't have the same implications on our uh, light microscopy and electron microscopy data. Where with this, you can bring into registration the high resolution block and the low resolution block. And the idea being, in the end, you end up with a description like this one, where you have uh, the low resolution stuff that you fill with the structures you found at the high resolution. And now the challenge, of course, is we can do that for little itsy bitsy part of cells. The idea would be to do that for the whole brain, which, of course, is going to um, keep us amused for a while. And just to give you an idea about the challenge that, that this represents, um, if I were, I mean, nobody is ever going to do this, but for a moment, let's, uh, a human brain has 100 billion neurons, roughly, and 100 trillion synapses. And if you were to represent all this at the five nanometer resolution I talked about, this will be 100 exabytes. I think I don't know what the number is today, but I think the total storage capacity of all computers on Earth is about a tenth of that or some fraction of that. So um, if you need applications that require seriously big processing of really big data, I have it for you. And with that, I'll, uh, I think I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. I will ask a lot of questions. Hold on, hold on. Higher level. So we're trying to map those to better understand the connections. Mm -hmm. What is what is the higher level objective of that structure? It, it really is computing the wiring diagram. So it's, it's, it's a piece of the puzzle. You, you want to know who's talking to. If you, who, you want the wiring diagram of the brain the same way you want the wiring diagram of a computer. So if I give you a computer, you've never seen one, and you want to understand how it works, if I just give you the wiring diagram, that probably is not going to be enough but it's one of the things you have to have to understand what it does. And that's what this vectomics field is all about. Of course, in addition to that, you need all the functional aspects, which, uh, so there are lots of other people who work also on in vivo data, where you also, you only, here I'm essentially going to get the pathways but you want to know what goes along these pathways, and that's then you get into the issues of connecting, of correlating the kind of imagery I've shown you with functional imagery. But again, there is also, you know, that's what I'm talking about a little bit on the stuff. Uh, do we know, for example, if the energy that it produces related to the volume or related to the unit? Can I don't think anybody knows. I mean, there are good questions. I mean, these are the questions that eventually will get answered. So, for example, I have been told that the, um, uh, they, I don't know if you've seen, but the images, they have, they, they look, they have this kind of striped appearance with this kind of uh, bands or and how thick these things are. I think it's connected to how much energy they produce. And so again, these are things nobody, I mean, basically, uh, I think nobody knows much. 
what is known, for example, and actually what probably drives a lot of these research is all the neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, in Alzheimer's patients, the mitochondria look bizarre. They don't have the right shape, they're scrunched up. So is it a symptom of the disease or is it the cause of the disease? I don't think anybody knows for sure, but there's certainly great interest in finding out. So when people, uh, you know, when people count the number of people, when researchers want to count the number of people in the crowd, right. so one, one way to do this is to actually second each person to count and the amount. The right. other way is actually looking for features to estimate density. Well, this kind of analogy applied to this. It would. I mean, you know, the, all the uh, learning to count papers. And, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, sure. I mean, this is another way of doing it. And, uh, I mean, both are valid. In some cases, you still, even if you have the, this learning to count technique, you still want to find individual people and find out where they want to go. In some cases, you don't. So in some sense, the, uh, what, I've show, what I've talked about, speeding up the scanning, mm -hmm. is of the learning to count fa flavor, right? You don't detect individual things. You just want to know in that area, well, probably there's something and that's good enough for you. So for your last uh, part of your work in the decision between DM imagery and EM1, yeah. For them, they seem to be just a down sample or low the scale for the high resolution one. Will the high resolution bring something for the institution or not? Well, um, the magic currently is down between the two yeah. clouds, right? Okay, so maybe I'll go, we go back to these images. Okay, so. Um, in this, so you essentially need these images to get the long range connectivity. Mm -hmm. But you don't see any of the details. There's nothing. It's just white. No, no, I understand. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you for the restriction part. For the what? Restriction. Restriction. Yeah, right. Whether the high resolution one will help you or you just found them to, you know, to get to the main. Well, if we just get the linear structure. Essentially, Central. we get the linear structures and we you do some, the and then we and then we do graph matching because mm -hmm. the one thing you will find in both places, it's the same junctions. Okay. So the equivalent in the case of say, normal photos is you have a map, you have a map of your area with all the overlays. You climb on the roof, mm -hmm. you take a picture of the streets around you, and the junctions are going to be the same. They look very different because the resolution is different but you'll have the same street junctions and you can try to match on that. These are features that you find at both scales. Mm -hmm. The thing I don't really understand about that is that, I guess you were describing before how you put the thing in a resin or something, you slice off the right. sections. That's destructive, right? Right. So how can you, so that's imaging it using, I guess, EM methods. Right. So how did, how did you get the other LM image at the same? Oh, but typically what you would do is you would, for example, do this in vivo for a while, which you can. And then, so you can observe an animal for weeks at a time. So I was saying is, for example, one of our colleagues in Geneva has a way of, he takes rats, replaces part of the skull by a transparent uh, thing. And then every week he takes an image like this one. And the idea is to, to, to see the dynamics, to see if the network is changing. And then at the end, so you do what you politely call sacrifice the rat. Uh, and then you can, do, you can do it only once, of course. You can do destructive imaging of this thing. And so this is now, and then this is a great data set because you have evolu in vivo evolution uh, for a while. And then at the end, you get one snapshot of what's inside all this. So there, was, there was also a slide you showed where the, the experts segmented the mitochondria into either dendritic uh, or axon, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mitochondria. Uh, so presumably that would, you know, that's because a bunch of them were, 
were in some dendrites and another of them were in some... Yeah, because they were looking at the images and say, okay, that looks like a... Oh, okay. So basically we had them overlaid on, uh, on the actual images. They were looking at the images. Okay, yes, this is a dendrite, this is an axon. And, and I can't tell the difference, right? I mean, uh, if they tell me it's an axon, it's an axon. <laughs> Okay, if there's no questions, then let's thank Pascal.